bricks and mortar, um, as indeed in the States. So with no further ado, I'd like to invite our uh, guest speaker, our um, keynote speaker, Marek, and he's allowed me not to say his surname because um, I'm sure I'll get it wrong. Marek, to the floor. Marek, please. My name is Marek Zmysłowski. I'm Polish, hence the long name. Because I'm Polish, it's also much easier to pronounce it when you have a couple shots of vodka. But that's enough of alcohol jokes. Um, I'm going to be telling about our story of building uh, online retailers or working with online retailers in Africa and a couple of adventures that we had on the way while um, doing this. So let me explain myself. I have moved to Nigeria in, in late 2012 to launch an online e-commerce called Jumia. Probably many of you know that company already. I'll be talking about Jumia a little bit later. Uh, then I've launched a software company called uh, Hotel Online, which made me being wanted by Interpol, because apparently this is now the way to deal with your competitors. I was actually secretly hoping that Interpol will come now. It will help me uh, sell my book better, but now they're not coming. Uh, I was also be responsible for the expansion of Glovo, which is a big online food delivery player in Europe. In Europe, we're bigger than Uber for Eats. Not so much in Africa. We've launched in Egypt, Morocco, uh, Kenya, and Cote d'Ivoire. And for the last couple of years, I've been running RTB House, which is a marketing technology company. So we focus mostly on working with e-commerce players and big retailers going e-commerce. And in South Africa, these are the brands we, we work with. I know that guys from One Day Only are here already, so hi. <laughs> Um, so we know a thing or two of you know either so basically running online online e-commerce uh, in in the South Africa region or Sub-Saharan region. So I'll be sharing a couple of uh, insights from that particular area. Although as you probably noticed, all these companies compete with each other. So I have to be really careful about what I can say, what I cannot say, because I'm going to be wanted by Interpol again. Um, yeah, again, about that Interpol. So we had a pretty extreme adventures with running this uh, online business in Africa because at one point we were able to go with Jumia to the New York Stock Exchange and do an IPO last year. Crazy story because two days after we did an IPO we went up 75%, now we're down by 90% uh, because retail investors are pretty, they have different sense, uh, sense of humor sometimes, they don't always understand the, 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 the nuts and bolts of e-commerce. But also at the other side, um, I was wanted by Interpol. Basically, the long story short, every time you open a company in a country like Nigeria or in Kenya, it's good to have a local pl uh, powerful player in your board to take care of you, to defend you when you get the negative attention from some people from the government. Let's just put it this way. The problem is when your godfather, let me just call it this way, decides that he doesn't want to, he doesn't need you in the company anymore. And then there's a very simple trick to do that especially in countries when there's a problem with corruption and when police is also a very corrupt institution, actually there's a price for an arrest warrant. It costs $50,000 in, uh, in my case in Nigeria. And when a country is a member of Interpol, then it gets escalated very fast. Imagine Interpol being like Facebook. If you ever had a situation when someone has posted a photo that maybe you had the image rights to, or posted a photo with you and you don't want this photo to be on Facebook, and you have the right to take down this photo, well, good luck talking to Facebook about taking this down. So everyone can upload anything, taking it down is not as easy. So this is how corrupt governments or, or governments with dictators are taking advantage of Interpol. Because any major police station in many, any country that is a member of Interpol can put an arrest warrant on you, as long as it was bought, into the system, and then it takes years to take it down. Uh, right now, after two years of fighting, uh, luckily, I am the first person in the history of Nigerian justice system, the first foreigner that took Nigerian police to court and won. I was awarded damages of $10,000. If anyone knows how to get money out of Nigerian police, please do give me a call. Um, this story of Jumia going IPO and, and fighting with, with Interpol and, and having to go take Nigerian police to court and then obviously appealing in Nigeria and, and, uh, in, appealing in Interpol in France, in France, I put into a book called Tracing Black Unicorns. Uh, the whole revenue from this book is actually being uh, forwarded into a foundation that is basically helping uh, empowering young ladies in Nigeria. There's more information about that on chasingblackunicorns.com. I decided to do that because I didn't want anyone to accuse me of making money on the book and clearing my name. But enough about uh, auto-promotion. I'm here to talk about building an online retailer in Africa and the reasons behind it. Why is a white Polish guy 
uh, going to Nigeria and then launching into other countries and building online retailer. Well, first of all, the story starts with a big company called Rocket Internet, which is a huge business incubator from Germany. We have launched almost 40 different e-commerce businesses all around the world. Actually, this map is already outdated. We, we hired, because I'm not with them anymore, at the best time around 15,000 people in more than 40 companies. We did e-commerce all over the world, besides United States in China. Very simple model, because we believed that at some point e-commerce will dominate everything. Why? Because when you look at this chart, it's pretty self-explanatory, right? Um, online e-commerce will take over retail space at some point. The question is why, and I'm going to get to that in a second. But also, these are the three founders that I used to work with, Oliver, Mark, and I always forget the third name, uh, Zamwares. Um, and we were always being accused of being the clone factory of the world. Because when we launched in Nigeria first in 2013, we essentially built all the seven verticals that Amazon at some point wanted to build. We've built the e-commerce part, we've built the marketplace part, we've built the classifieds, we've built the online food delivery, ride hailing, and online travel. Uh, classifieds were divided into cars and houses, this is why in total there were seven. Because when you look at the market, those seven business models are always the biggest in the internet space. And not too many people remember, but Amazon actually started with those seven verticals at some point. Not everything was working for them, so they shut them down. What we have realized is that Copying a business model from the States into Africa is the only thing you can copy. Everything else has to be uh, figured out from scratch. Uh, our approach was very simple. We make a bet on capitalism, because when capitalism wins in the world, together with capitalism, people's behavior, culture, gets unified. So the typical behaviors of a Nigerian middle class, Kenyan middle class, with time will become more and more similar to what's happening in the US. And if capitalism wins, then what we also have to look at? Okay, people, there's more and more people, right? So that's great. The purchasing power is also going up. There's more and more middle class. So there's more people that have more money to spend. That's great. Mobile banking is growing. So they will have a way to pay for the goods. That's great. And the internet is getting cheaper and cheaper. Uh, I remember in 2013, we were paying for a 20 megabit per second internet connection in Lagos, we're paying $5,000 for this. And, and now the same, uh, the same uh, speed is, if I'm correct, like $500. So it's going down very, very fast. So we had all the KPIs that work. And obviously everyone is using their phones. So I can reach my customer everywhere they are. The top countries using mobile traffic, uh, internet mobile traffic are African countries. So what could go possibly go wrong? Well, as Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan until it gets punched. he gets punched in the face. That same ha thing happened with us. This is a typical highway in Nigeria. Yes, it is a highway. It's just not working for the last couple of years because every time cars are stopped, there are a lot of people trying to sell them anything from cigarettes to water, even to uh, sinks. Uh, and that's how, how market looked like in Nigeria. So we obviously had to figure out every type of e-commerce operations from scratch for them to work first in Nigeria, then in Kenya, then in Rwanda, Ghana, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, and a couple of other countries we have, we have launched into. The first biggest problem was the warehousing. Because we are in e-commerce. We're not like in states where we can just sell something online and the moment the sale is made, the sale is made on our site, only then we, go to, we, call, our, uh, we call our supplier and we tell them send us the, the stuff. Or even better, sell that stuff directly to the customer. That's how Amazon started. They've uploaded one million book titles. They didn't even have those books. When an order came, they just called the book supplier and they told them, send that book directly to the customer. We couldn't do that. We had to build our own warehousing. And considering the fact that in Nigeria, 80% of the goods are imported from China, through the harbor, with customs, and so many other things that can go wrong, we had to freeze uh, in our warehouse goods valued at $10 million having sales, daily sales of not more than $10,000. That's how much we had to stock because we couldn't rely on the just-in-time logistics. And then we also had to start inviting merchants to our site because we just couldn't handle growing, only selling our stuff. So we invited local merchants to sell their own goods on our site. And then another Pandora box was opened because trying to control their quality of goods and delivery on time 
well, it's a story for another book. Another problem we had is the technology adoption in, in, in sub-Saharan countries. Uh, this, was, this picture was made in 2015. That's the biggest uh, roundabout in Lagos, Nigeria. And you see there a street billboard from Google explaining what Google is. Um, Google also sponsored TV ads before the main TV news, explaining that there's this service called Google.ng, and you can go there and you can search for different type of information. So if the most popular service on the internet still has to do education in those underdeveloped regions, that kind of gives us an, uh, an insight on how much education needs to be done for people to buy stuff online, because there's so many hurdles and, and the process is so complicated. So that was another problem we had to figure out. Another case was that we've noticed that big FMCG brands and big retailers in Nigeria and in Kenya, obviously, and in other sub-Saharan countries were spending a lot of money uh, on street billboards. And we really didn't know why, you get, why those big brands are doing this, but we figured if they're doing this, we should be doing this as well. I guess this is the worst argumentation in business you can have. We're doing this because everyone is doing this. So we're spending $20,000 per month on the street billboard next to the airport that gave us absolutely zero conversion, or at least we couldn't even measure this. At the same time, our very smart local competitor, Udala, spent the same amount of money not on street boards, but doing pickup points for people that are afraid to buy stuff online because they don't want to pay online, they don't want to pay because they're afraid someone will steal their credit card details, and they definitely do not trust some online company to buy stuff online, so they want to first go to the pickup points and, and check that stuff before paying. So essentially, online online company to grow has to become offline. And running the store uh, in, in a month costs as much as the street billboard. And you can imagine which type of marketing really gives you more advantage. So again, we had to become offline retail to become as eventually a big e-commerce player in the long term. So obviously we've launched our own pickup points. Just in Kenya, we had 450 of them in hotels, somewhere at the squares, where not only people could come and look at the goods and, and pay for them only after, after they see them, and then we tried to do cross-selling, we tried to convince them to maybe order food online the next time they do this, the next time they're hungry, or maybe buy a ticket uh, also with us. But most importantly, those were the, the product delivery points for our merchants. Because we didn't do warehousing for our merchants, they didn't want to freeze uh, their money with us. They didn't want to do drop shipping with us. We had to sell their stuff on our site without having that goods in our hands. And only after the sales was made, we had to call our merchants for them to deliver those goods to our pickup points. And then only, and only then we could, only, we could sell, we could deliver the stuff uh, to the client. Speaking of delivery, um, in 2013, when we launched, there was no delivery player that could deliver large quantities of small products to, uh, to individual clients. So we had to build delivery on our own. Again, Amazon didn't have to do that. Uh, so in 2000, at the end of 2014, when we combined all the cars we had in lease and all the bikes and all the tricycles in total from all our countries, we were the largest delivery company in Africa. We we're larger than DHL or FedEx when you combine the number of drivers joining for us. Because we had to be, go offline to run an online business. Another problem was the disproportion of wealth. I'm not sure if you know, but Nigeria, a country of 180 million people, only 2 million people make more than $9,000 per year. So these are the people that Nigeria want that can afford Dollar Florin. There's only 2 million of them. Half of them is in Lagos. The rest is scattered. Nigeria, too, making uh, from 5,000. Those are those people that can afford stuff from ShopRite. And then everyone else, the only brand they can afford is salt. Everything else they, they buy from, from gray market. There are no brands really there. So in order to scale, you have to be extremely precise. Because with such a disproportion of wealth, when you scale with your marketing activities, you're going to be losing so much money because of how scattered your clients are and how hard it is to, uh, to, to reach them. And that's where it hit us. And that's where I decided to, to, move, to, to, do, to do the switch from Jumia to, to R2B House. Because when I looked at Jumia and when I looked at our marketing activities, especially our online activities, I have noticed something extremely counterintuitive. The bigger we were in scale, 
the more efficient we were, become, became. The bigger our scale of conversions was, the higher ROI we were able to pull out. So we were growing 200% year over year in terms, of, uh, in terms of scale of conversions in those six years, but at the same time our ROI on online marketing spend tripled. So that doesn't happen, because usually when my operations grow, my efficiency goes down, but not in online marketing, apparently. And the reason for that was that in many of our operations in online marketing and acquiring users, we are using AI. And AI is a buzzword right now, probably everyone is talking about it, but the reality is that if you want to talk to an AI robot, he's an idiot, or she's an idiot. I never know what's the sex of an AI. Uh, but there are certain narrow areas that AI is very good at. And AI is extremely good at analyzing big sets of data and coming up with conclusions from them. So we started going deeper and deeper and deeper. And RTB House, I don't want to do too much of marketing, but RTB House right now is, um, is the only company that uses deep learning into acquiring users for retail sector in the world. And the difference between deep learning and machine learning let me use this, let me explain this uh, using the most favorite example of the internet, which is cats. So if you want to learn, if you want to teach machine learning robot how to spot a cat on a photo, you have to upload one million photos, and then you have to define the rules to search for. Search for eyes. Oh, these are the examples of cat eyes. Search for legs. These are the example of cat legs. Search for tail, and these are the example of cat tail. Essentially, a human has to teach him. With deep learning, you just upload one million photos of cats, and you say there's a, there's a cat on the photo. You upload one million photos of no cats, or photos without a cat, and you say there's no cat. Go figure it out. And the deep learning comes out with its own conclusions how to spot a cat based on enforced learning. There was a cat, there was not a cat. And this apparently works amazingly well in online marketing, because when we analyze uh, user's behavior, obviously what we're trying to do, what every marketer in retail space is trying to do, is we're trying to analyze user's past behavior to predict his or her future behavior. And everything breaks down to this. That's what all, always marketers were trying to do. Understand our clients to predict what they want to buy and when, because the better I am at prediction, the less I spend on marketing advertisement, that doesn't work. So if I have uh, $100 in a classical example, uh, then, and I need to show my ad to 100 users, I would just spend one, $1 per, per each user. What deep learning is doing is that for every user that ever visits our site, it defines an, a, a specific probability percentage amount for this particular user, and we know that for this user it makes sense to spend more money and be more aggressive with marketing, and for the other user, we spend less money. Another thing with the difference between deep learning and machine learning and we, is basically we don't need as many marketers as earlier because we don't need humans to do that. When a human runs your marketing activities, he probably is going to come up with 50, maybe 100, okay, maybe 200 different user segments. He will divide them or she will divide them by demography, by sex, by purchasing power, by what they like, what they dislike, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's only so many divisions that a human can make. So a campaign can have up to 200 customer segments when a human does it. When deep learning does it, 10,000 users, 10,000 user segments is on the low side. And obviously, the more granular in user segmentation, the more precise you are in marketing spend. Um, Another thing that we started doing first at Jumia and then at RTB House is we started showing dynamic ads, which showing, uh, which are showing the products that the user wants to buy and when. And we had always two problems with those type of ads. Uh, first of all, the PR manager or the branding manager, he said they are ugly, they don't fit our corporate identity, which you should change them. But then we showed them the, the results. Mo three times more people click on them than your nice, beautiful, beautiful ads. And obviously some clients are upset because they think that there's a big brother chasing them, reading their messages, and, and, and analyzing what they talk about and showing them the ads about that. You probably heard those stories. The reality is those people leave so much information on their Facebook and wh whatever they look for that no one really needs to read their messages because of how much info they put, put online. And with education, people realize that they can talk to the ad, they can click on the ad and they can say, I don't want to see this anymore or change this ad and they will never see it anymore. The problem lies in education. Another thing what, we, what we've done is if, if we can show this particular ad, yeah, it's a video ad. 
So we started doing this at Jumia first, uh, especially in this region, because we've noticed that the internet connection is getting cheaper and cheaper, so people are st and faster and faster, so people started to watch videos. A lot of retail brands and a lot of clothing brands were investing in video ads, uh, but it was always a different marketing channel. So we decided to combine video with performance marketing, and what we did is we always show a video at first, which catches the attention of the user, and then after that we show uh, the particular product. Now, what you probably didn't figure out from this video is that this video is also personalized. So depending on the user and his past behavior, he will see different products on this particular video, which before that was impossible because you would have to come up with hundreds of thousands of different versions of this particular video if a human did that. And the video is obviously great because it catches attention. We didn't stop there. Um, everyone has a phone now, right? So if someone has a phone and at least some of the apps that each particular client is using are showing the live location of that particular person, like WhatsApp, like Uber, and a couple of other apps that have to show always the location of the user in order for them to provide the basic service, and if we can buy the data of this particular user where he is, then just like I was applying my knowledge of deep learning where I was looking at what the user searches for on your website, and then based on that I was showing him ads, I can apply the same knowledge now inside your physical store. Because when I know what the user is looking at in your store, I can serve him the ads based on your physical store. And now it's not needed to install any beacons in your store. At some point, someone just has to go to your store with a video and just record where all the products are shown. Every time your uh, phone of a user is online and it sends location, it's always being triangu triangulated with at least three, three network uh, points, Wi-Fi and maybe two telco points. And as long as you triangulate it from three, uh, three poles, then you know exactly where the user is with a precision up to 1.6 meters. So when you are in a Zara or when you are in a grocery store, you know more or less which type of products are where. And then we are able to build a map of user behavior in an offline store and then serve him ads online. This works amazingly well when an online company wants to serve their own ads based on the user behavior in a competitor store that is offline, which is uh, your competitor, or an offline retailer that wants to show ads of your products to a user that has been to your store but has left without purchasing. The same methodology can be now blended between online and offline. Um, so we've, we've, we've spoken at RTB House to many retailers in South Africa, and I've built this definition of a big retailer in South Africa. A big retailer in South Africa always has at least hundreds of stores, and then he also has an online store. Would you agree with me? And I think this is the, where the problem lies, because the boards of big retailers in South Africa consider an online store just as in another store. And that's, in Polish, the saying is, and that's where the dog is buried. Because as long as you will be treating your online store just as an another store, then the growth will never happen, because obviously online store will maybe deliver 1%, maybe 2%, maybe 3% of the total revenue uh, when you have 100 other stores. And the problem, has to, the problem is really in perception. Uh, of you know what online can do for you because there's just so many things an online retailer an offline retailer can uh, do and how he can use online to boost his offline store like i said online online companies like ours we had to go offline to grow we had to build all the things that you guys do anyway you have sorted logistics you have sorted suppliers and you have physical points where people can actually go and touch the stuff before they buy it we had to build all that to compete with you, yet we grow faster than you. And, and, and what, what a retailer can do is, for example, once, obviously, there's the technology involved, once you know where, where your products are, in which house, which shops, then you can treat those shops as distributed uh, warehouses. And when we know the location of the user, we can show him an ad showing that, for example, there's a shop 200 meters away from you, 
we want, there's, I don't know, there's a couple of genes, a pair of genes we want to get rid of because it's from two seasons away, so we're giving, him, uh, we're giving him a huge discount. So you can use the physical knowledge of where the user is and where your inventory is to, to create ads which are location-based. Uh, obviously, when, when the user comes back to your store that he purchased anything online, there's a chance for you to upsell. The only chance for us to upsell anything is at the checkout site. So someone just bought, uh, uh, I don't know, a shoes and a pair of jeans, and then at the checkout site, I may try to sell him something else, maybe also buy a pair of glasses towards it. That's my only chance of upselling anything. But if a user, you know, buying something from an offline store, uses click and collect, you not only have a chance to upsell at the point of checkout online, but you also have a chance of upsell when he comes to the store to pick up the stuff. Obviously, so much data is you are guys are sitting on. Uh, if you have loyalty programs, the problem is always with the technology debt to extract that data and match the data of your loyalty program with the behavior of the users online. But I can predict that the first retail player that does it in South Africa will, will be light years ahead of anyone else. Um, okay, enough of trying to be as smart as here. Uh, we, have, we have come a full circle because Everyone is talking now how digital revolution will, uh, will change how the retail players are working. But the fact is that online retailers are now going back to offline in order to, to grow in, in, in underdeveloped regions. We have to sort out our own logistics and we have to sort out our own uh, problems with clients' trust. But at the same time, those big guys like Amazon or Alibaba in developed markets they are going offline anyway to provide better experience for the users. So obviously, uh, you know, the answer to the question whether digital revolution is an apocalypse or a blessing for retailers is it can be both or it can be either depending how you're going to take advantage of it. But my point to make here is that your biggest competitor in the digital revolution um, is not other retail player but the online player who has already become big enough to have enough resources to compete with you easily uh, in the offline, in the offline, of offline sphere, and they will enter the physical play, the physical player ground, as soon as they will realize that there is just not enough growth in the online space. And I guess that's where I'm gonna, uh, where I'm gonna stop. Thank you for your attention. If anyone is interested in, you know, just hearing more uh, about what we do at RTB House, I'm checking the book. These are the, the social media channels and the websites that um, you, can, you can get in touch. And thank you so much for your attention. Morning. Uh, morning, Merk. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was really informative. I just wanted to know, uh, from your experience dealing with online retailers across, Af across Africa, um, do you think that there can be an online retailer that can truly expand across the continent in order for you to be to... to um, to provide products in every single country across the continent using the free trade agreement, or do you think that that's still something that uh, the current major uh, physical and online retailers can be able to do um, at, a, at a later stage when they start realizing their potential? Yeah, um, so from Jumia experience, we don't see any synergies, any big, any relevant synergies from being in so many countries because uh, the cross-border trade is extremely hard until you know, administration problems within the African Union will be solved. Um, it's actually easier to import goods from China now than to move them from, from Nigeria to Senegal. So uh, the, the, the cross-border was, was never, never a case because of how many hurdles, uh, hurdles uh, there are. Hi, thanks so much. That was great. Um, just a question for me. I know online retail makes up about 1.4% um, of total retail currently in South Africa, if I'm correct. And but that's including online travel. And online travel has high GMV. So if you take this out, it's even less. Okay, so what's it about 1% or less? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so by 2020, all inclusive, they're expecting it to reach about 2%, right? In your experience across Africa with Jumia, what are the three top essential things that we need to look out for, specifically in retail, to make sure that we could take uh, more of this value going forward in the next two, three years? What are the top three? Yeah, I mean, uh, in there, I'm sure there are plenty of things, but what, what are the essentials in, that we need to look out for to make sure that we can capture um, a bigger piece of the market going so into online? Because I'm with RTB House now, I should say spend more money on online marketing, <laughs> take that money from TV and billboards because it is just doesn't perform. It's just like a tax for being a, a, a respected brand. Uh, 
But I think that the, the thing that, obviously, besides that, the thing that really can move the needle is spending more time on, on the data that you guys are sitting on. Because you just have so much data that you are sitting on that is scattered in so many areas of the company operations. But you, you don't have the systems that allow you to take advantage of that data because, obviously, it requires some, some additional implementation of, of ERP systems, you know, basic BI systems. And I can imagine how painful that is in a, in a, in a legacy company. Uh, because the legacy that you guys have, most big retailers are super old here and big. The legacy that you have is your blessing and a curse at once. Yeah. So these are two, but super important. Okay.